There are families out there searching Of loved ones lost There's a lifetime of hurting Praying one day they'll find The missing family began the evening of March 8, 2007. The little boy went out to play after school, last seen on a nearby swing set at 6.15, reported missing two hours later. Six-year-old Christopher Bears Jr. from Brunswick, Georgia, was a gorgeous little boy whose light was put out too soon by four evil monsters. What they did to this little boy is almost too evil to speak about, but his story needs to be told in order to show us the darkness that seeds itself in human form, so we can learn what's lurking out there, waiting in the shadows. It will make us think twice about where we allow our children to go, even in our own neighborhood. Before we begin, I would like to give you a strong warning on this case. The story of Christopher may be one of the worst cases I have ever told in the murder she shed, so viewer discretion is advised. Hello, my name is Holly, and this is the Murder She Shed, the place we honor the dead right from my she shed. For more rare true crime cases, just make sure you hit that subscribe button to join me and my little breather back here, usually weekly, right here in the Murder She Shed. Christopher Barris Jr. lived with his father and stepmother in a Glen County mobile home park in Brunswick, Georgia. And his grandmother also lived nearby in that same park. Christopher was a shy little boy who had an impressive smile that showed off his silver-capped front teeth. He loved superheroes such as Spider-Man and Batman. His well-used bike, video games, and a stray cat in his neighborhood he had adopted and named Jimmy. That just shows the kind heart that he had to, to take a stray and adopt him and love him as his own. Such a sweet little boy. Before going to bed each night, Christopher would tell each and every one of his family members, Good night, God bless you, and I love you. His smile would light up a room, and the whole world was his playground. 61-year-old David Edenfield lived with his wife Peggy and his adult son, 34-year-old George, in the same mobile home park as Christopher, but just across the street from Christopher's grandmother. George Edenfield was a predator who had two prior convictions for child dating from 1997. George was required to register as an offender after he pleaded guilty in 1997 to two boys, seven and nine. George was considered mentally disabled, supposedly had a cognitive ability of a five-year-old. But I had some reports saying that he was smarter than he let on. So, not sure how true that is. He had recently moved into the mobile home park with his parents after having been ordered to move by the sheriff in September 2006 from a house on Union Street because it was determined that residence was in close proximity to a park where children congregated. Even though many children lived in this mobile home park, he still was allowed to move in. David Edenfield, George's father, also has a history of being a offender. David pled guilty to incest in 1994 for having a relationship with his own daughter. David and Peggy both, though, were both suspected of having essayed both their children, George and the daughter. When their children were small, David had been seen hitting both of his children with two-by-fours. Many neighbors were terrified of George. One woman in the neighborhood said that George walked up to her while she was outside working in her yard and he had hedge clippers in his hand. He said, I'm going to cut your bush after he opened and shut the clippers close to her abdomen. She backed away from him quickly, got into her house, and locked the door. It wasn't the first time that he had harassed her. He had banged on her door before with his fists and yelled obscenities. George had also stalked and propositioned two teenage boys and waited for them at the bus stop frequently in the afternoons when they came home from school. He had a history of watching all the children in the neighborhood, including Christopher. Christopher and other children in the area had been warned to stay away from that trailer, not to get near the Edenfield trailer. But Christopher had to go on a trail right by the Edenfield trailer to get from his house to his grandmother's house. 
and he usually went to his grandmother's house almost daily. In the afternoon of March 8, 2007, around 2.45 p.m., Christopher returned home from school, and he went to see his grandmother. He stayed with his grandmother for about 30 minutes, and then he just went back outside and went to his own home to get some toys, including a lifesaver sword. He was carrying this sword around when a neighbor seen him at about 6 p.m., and he was playing in a yard down the road. About 15 minutes after that, another neighbor saw Christopher just skipping toward his home, smiling and carrying that toy sword. Around the same time, his stepmother discovered that Christopher was no longer with his grandmother. She thought he'd been over to his grandmother's house, and his grandmother thought he was home. So then they realized he was missing. So they began to search for him, eventually calling for his father to leave work early and join the search. When the search failed to turn up any sign of Christopher, his father called the authorities. That evening around 9 p.m., a police investigator saw a lightsaber in the yard of the Edenville home, and he observed the occupants of that home peeking out the windows. The investigators knocked on the door, and when Peggy answered, the investigator saw a man later identified as Donald Dale, a friend of the Edenfield family, who seemed to be trying to hide in the home. The investigator asked the Edenfield family and Dale to step onto the porch and speak with him. They did, although the investigator noticed that whenever he tried to ask George a question, David or Peggy would actually answer for him. Eventually, the investigator asked George to walk to the road with the investigator, and there, George told the investigator that he had seen Christopher playing outside, and after the devil had called his name, the devil then directed him to kill Christopher. Then, of course, after George confessed to this, he was taken to the police headquarters for an intense interview, and he was later arrested. George refused to tell the authorities where Christopher's body was, though. The police and 300 volunteers began to look for Christopher's little body, but with no success. On March the 12th, they went to Peggy's trailer to search for the presence of methane gas. Methane is a detective byproduct of decomposing bodies, and their detectors found methane in substantial levels. Police decided to have another chat with Peggy. This time, she told police she witnessed her son George and husband David both choking young Christopher until he was dead. She further admitted to the authorities that George had tried to remove any of his fingerprints from around little Christopher's throat by cleaning him up using a pot of water and some soap and then wrapping Christopher's body in plastic trash bags. It was at this point police executed an emergency search of the Edenfield trailer and removed one bag of unknown evidence and seized a shovel. Peggy then sent police on a wild goose chase in several different locations where she insisted Christopher's body would be found, but it wasn't. Her husband David offered equally conflicting information about where Christopher would be found. And so did Donald Dale, the friend that had been in the Edenville home that day of Christopher's disappearance. Peggy was arrested that day, and her husband David on the next day, March 13th, each on charges of obstruction of justice, making false claims to police, and for concealing a death. Family pal Donald Dale was arrested very shortly after David and charged with the same charges as the other two. The suspects were escorted to various sites they claimed were where Christopher's body could be found, but none of those searches actually proved fruitful. They were just lying. An extensive search of the area surrounding the mobile home park was conducted, utilizing search dogs, searchers on ATVs, heat-sensing aircraft, and National Guard personnel. By a stroke of good fortune, a Georgia park ranger found Christopher's body on Thursday, March 15th some two miles from his home, contained within a black plastic trash bag covered in bugs and located some 15 feet off the road. The discovery was not as a result of any statement by it made by any of the four in jail, but by police finally widening the search area beyond what they had combed repeatedly. After David's arrest, he would only admit to helping hide the body, but later he did admit to helping George lure Christopher into their trailer 
by asking him if he would like to come in and play some video games. George took him to his bedroom where he did have many video games and they began to play. They only played for a few minutes. Then David admitted that he helped to hold Christopher down as George hit him. David then essayed Christopher while George held him down. You would think Peggy would see what was happening and stop it, but no, she was just as evil as the men. Peggy watched the whole time and played with herself. These are disgusting, disgusting people. I don't understand how the world has these kind of people in it. Just infuriates me. I never understand how people can be so evil. I mean, a whole family of people that evil? It's just unbelievable. Brave little Christopher fought to escape, begged them to stop, and threatened to tell his family. This made George begin to strangle him because he was just mad about Christopher threatening to tell his grandma. At some point, David admitted he put his own hands over George's hands to see what it would feel like to participate in a killing. David said he felt an excitement from the thrill of killing. After they had strangled Christopher and his lifeless body lay on the floor, David and Peggy then got off again while looking at the little boy's body. I don't even know, guys. Just disgusting. Then David called his friend Donald Dell to come to the trailer to help them dispose of Christopher's body. David, Peggy, George, and Donald Dell put little Christopher's body in plastic trash bags and dumped his body only two miles from his home. According to the medical examiner, Christopher had been essayed and strangled. In addition, Christopher had been bitten on his back, buttocks, and privates. There also were bruises and other trauma injuries to the boy's throat, privates, and legs. All these injuries were sustained while little Christopher was still alive. Moreover, semen was discovered in the plastic bags in which Christopher was found. In exchange for her testimony, Peggy avoided the death penalty. She was eventually sentenced to 60 years in prison. Dale was sentenced to serve an additional three months in jail in addition to the 15 months already served while awaiting trial. The remaining three and a half years were spent on probation in a state home for the mentally disabled, and it was agreed the home would not be in Glen County, partly for his own safety. Dale told the judge he did not plan to come back to Glen County. That way, he can stay out of trouble. Donald Dale had been a friend of George Edenfield's for a few years. They both had an interest in playing video games. Donald Dale has no criminal history and his attorney claims Donald was duped into aiding the Edenfields in disposing of Christopher's body. His attorney also claimed that Donald did not quite understand the questions asked of him by investigators. George was found not competent to stand trial and has been in a state mental hospital ever since he murdered little Christopher. Although authorities agreed that George had a diminished mental capacity, they believed he did understand the difference between right and wrong. This is evidenced by recordings of conversations made between him and his mother. He was able to explain to his mother bail process as well as understanding what his mother told him on how to lie about covering up Christopher's murder. David was found guilty on all counts and was given the death penalty. As of 2023, he is still waiting execution. On Christopher's memorial page, his stepmother posted this poem, Your little boy cries too much. My little boy makes no sound. Your little boy is warm to the touch. Mine lies cold in the ground. Your little boy woke up to die. My angel never will. Your little boy can laugh and play. My little boy lies still. Your little boy makes you so proud, but just as proud as I, cause though your boy will learn to walk, my little boy can fly. Rest in peace, sweet Christopher. Hope you are having fun in your little angel wings. Horrible story. It's unbelievable how a whole family can be that evil and Okay, they were a little mentally disabled, but I don't care. A lot of people are mentally disabled, but you know what? They don't go out and do things like this. And as you guys all know, I was essayed when I was six to seven years old by a neighbor of my grandma's. Or, or y'all should know, if you've seen my past videos, you'd know this story. I just can't imagine 
the evil that must be in these people to take an innocent child and to do such horrible things to them. Just grieves my soul when I do these kinds of stories. And you know, guys, I always put bloopers on the end, but sometimes some stories are just really hard to do that. I might put a few on the end, but this one was definitely a hard one. I do it just so I don't leave y'all so depressed because some of these that I do on children are just extremely awful. And this one was right up there with one of the most awful I've done. It just made me so sad. And I don't want to leave y'all like that today. Anyway, I want to do maybe with something better. I do love y'all and I hope y'all have a blessed day. And he knows that this is the end and he's excited about that. He wants to go chase my house people out there building my house. Everybody, If you watch, you also know I lost my house to a tornado this summer. So they're out there rebuilding. Yeah, we almost died. You need to go back and watch that video if you haven't seen it. I actually accidentally filmed during the tornado. So, yeah, it's or at least it's terrifying to me. It was terrifying. And I've lived in Oklahoma all my life, and I've never been scared of tornadoes. I am now. Our new house will have a tornado shelter. We learned our lesson on that. Anyway, tell them bye. Tell them you love them, and you'll see them. Actually, I won't see y'all for, unless I film in Colorado, I won't see y'all for a couple weeks. But I'm going to do a lot of painting out there. I'm going to do some oil painting. I'm going to make this huge painting for my house in my bedroom. I bought this huge canvas, and it's going to take a while for me to do this. I don't know why I get myself into these things. Why don't I just buy one for a few dollars? All right. See y'all later. Love y'all. Bye. People are here working on my house again. And you know Simon, he got to be Mr. Frosty. And he got to protect his mama always. He's a mama protector, aren't you, Bubba? They're all right. They're not going to hurt mama. They're not going to hurt mama. They're here to work on the house, Bubba. For morally rare, for morally rare. Let's try this again. For morally, no, <laughs> try this again. For more rare true crime cases, unfathomable, at unfathomable to the mind. You know what I'm trying to say. Okay, guys, the other day I went to Walmart and I had this little jumper, black jumper on it, but I kept thinking, why is all these guys looking at me? And I was like, what's going on here? Right in the middle of Walmart, you know, as nasty as walmart is and the weirdest things you see you wouldn't think this would be really weird but apparently people thought it was weird or i wasn't paying attention I'm just walking along doing my shopping and all that stuff and here i am i have that jumpsuit on and two or three buttons are all the way down to all my stomach my jumpsuit is unbuttoned i looked down and i was like oh that explains a lot right now that explains a lot anyway i button myself back up i don't know if i'm ever gonna wear this jumpsuit again because that is the second time that jumpsuit has revealed me and i thought the first time that it unbuttoned just one of the buttons before i thought it was my little nephew who had been poking me like this and it caused the button to come unbuttoned and apparently not this jumpsuit likes to expose me, I've learned. Either I'm going to have to wear a shirt on it, sew the buttonhole smaller, or something. I don't know why such weird things happen to me. And you wouldn't think that'd be bad considering what you see in Walmart. I guess it was just, somebody might have got me on video walking around like this. One of these days y'all may see me on YouTube just walking around with my shirt open. Somebody like, this is what we seen in Walmart today. Well, We'll find out. If you see me on YouTube, just say, Oh, I remember that story she told me. It's okay. It's just Holly. Just her normal, everyday business. There are families out.